Thank you so much, everyone, um, for being here. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Great. OK. Um, so as Alex said, I am a new staff in the Africa Madagascar program. I was not fortunate enough to give a public job talk. Um, so this, I wanted to use this opportunity to sort of present about some of my research interests. I went back and forth on how to structure this talk. Um, it should, it was going to be called um, the evolutionary history of baobabs across spatial and temporal scales, but that's a little dry. Um, so I chose Baobabs of Africa and Madagascar, and we will talk a lot about some of the natural history of Baobabs, um, which is why they're such magical trees. So um, just a little bit about me. I'm just generally fascinated in the incredible diversity of plants globally, patterns and processes that contribute to plant diversification. So my research spans varying evolutionary scales. So I'm particularly interested in collect in um, connecting sort of larger macroevolutionary patterns to patterns of gene flow at the interspecific level, so gene flow between species, particularly across geographic scales. And then I'm also interested in population level variation or intraspecific variation. And this latter scale, I think, is particularly important uh, because not only for species delimitation, which is sort of the fundamental unit for conservation, um, but we also should expect a high degree of variation in populations because that is the unit that selection acts upon. And so the way I've structured my talk today is uh, to hopefully illustrate the importance of um, uh, doing research across these varying evolutionary scales. So uh, I am formally trained as a plant systematist, but prior to that, I worked as a field botanist and a restoration ecologist for various nonprofit uh, organizations as well as government organizations. And so because of that background prior to my academic training, I like to think I bring sort of an ecologist perspective to sort of classic systematics based research. Um, and so some of the approaches I used are illustrated here, although this is really isn't comprehensive. Um, so obviously my work relies heavily on field surveys and herbarium specimens. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm interested in spatial patterns of biodiversity. I utilize biogeographic methods, population genetics, phylogenomics, ecological studies that you'll see today, um, but really with the end goal of informing conservation action. So that's sort of where my research should be applied to, or at least I hope. Okay, so I'm going to um, illustrate some of my various sort of broad approaches to my research today, doing a case study in the baobab trees. So baobabs, I would argue, are some of the most iconic plant species on Earth. Um, but there, surprisingly, there's a lot of questions about their evolutionary history uh, that still remain. And today I'll sort of dive into some of these questions, although I won't have um, time to talk about everything. All of these species are quite um, dominant figures on the landscape, and their size is just astounding. So this picture here, and for scale, here I am. This is the Segole baobab in South Africa. It's arguably the largest baobab um, in the world. It has a circumference that ranges from 33 to about 45 meters. And I say it ranges because the girth of the tree fluctuates depending on if it's the wet or the dry season. So within a year, the, the trunk actually can swell up or shrink depending on if it just flushed its leaves or put out flowers and fruit um, or if it's later in the dry season. And I always like to think about um, just how magical these trees are because you can imagine the stories that this individual tree holds because it's been on the landscape for thousands of years. And perhaps because of their great size and longevity across much of their range, there's a lot of folklore associated with the trees. They're strongly associated with people. So whenever there's a village, there's often a resident baobab, like in this picture of Madagascar here, down in South Africa here. And all parts of the tree are used. Uh, over a hundred different uses have been documented. So everything from um, growing the seeds for their tubers, for their, excuse me, their tap roots to be eaten, um, their fruits are made into porridges or juice, their leaves are steamed and eaten, 
Even the trees that get hollowed out have been used as cisterns for holding water. In Australia, they've been used as prisons. Um, and in South Africa, there is a, um, a tree on private property that's actually been converted into a bar. So you can enter the baobab and have a little cocktail. And um, in addition to all of these human uses, which we could spend the next hour talking about alone, they're um, also you know, important um, ecological species, often characterized as being a keystone species. OK, so I've been talking generally about baobabs, but baobabs actually refers to the genus Adansonia. There are currently eight recognized species. Um, and they have this really interesting biogeographical pattern. So there's one species, Digitata, found widespread across continental Africa. Its range is there in the dark gray. There are currently six species described in Madagascar. And then there's one species found in the remote northwest part of Australia. They actually refer to it as the Boab rather than the Baobab. Uh, all of these species have pretty incredible floral diversity that I'm showing you here. So an individual tree flowers for about a month. When they flower is dependent on the species. Um, but each tree flowers for, for about a month, and they have hundreds of flowers um, at a given time. They are all extremely large. So the African baobab flower can be about this large. They're all extremely fragrant. And they all have similar pollination biology in that they're all nocturnally pollinated, um, whether it be by bats, hawk moths, or lemurs. Uh, the important thing about their pollination biology that's really quite remarkable given the size of their flowers is that an individual flower is only receptive for one single night. And so you can imagine the energy to put out these huge flowers and then these trees only have about 12 hours in order for, um, for, for, for pollination to occur. And so if you're interested in observing a flower opening, you have to first um, look for this cracking of the calyx. This happens about late in the afternoon. You can kind of spot which ones are going to flower that evening. And then literally as the sun is setting, you can watch these calyces sort of peel open and spring to life in the course of like 30 minutes. And um, again, then they only have that single night to be pollinated. And then by early the next morning, these flowers are already wilting and falling from the trees. So if you're out at a site early in the morning, again, it's, they produce hundreds of trees at a given time. It literally feels like it's raining baobab flowers on you. So I'm summarizing some of the previous systematic revisions that took place on this slide here. So previous work by David Baum um, uh, constructed sort of a genealogical history based on pollination system, floral morphology, floral color, um, and molecular data. So I'm summarizing that in the phylogeny here. And the main takeaways are that there are three lineages that correspond to geography. So there's the Australian species, the African species, and then there was a single dispersal event to Madagascar where they diversified um, into the six species that we know of today. Within this group in Madagascar, there's two sections, the section Breve Tube here, the section Longa Tube here. And because I'm going to talk about them so much as uh, individuals, I want to Perfect, yeah, uh, introduce them a little bit more. So the section Brevetuve in Madagascar is comprised of this pair of allopatric species. Uh, so Suarezensis and Grandidieri. Grandidieri is probably the most famous species of Madagascar. The avenue of baobabs um, is the picture that usually comes up for Madagascar. It's the species Grandidieri that I'm showing you here. Uh, its sister species is Suarezensis, found in the remote uh, northern part of the island. And both of these trees have similar flower structures, you can see here. So their floral morphology is very similar. They're both lemur and bat pollinated. And they have very similar canopy architecture as well. Um, the one thing that I love is that, so they have this calyx that's sort of uh, shaped like a cup where the nectar pools. And that's where you can observe lemurs sitting on and drinking uh, out of like the, the cup. It's pretty, pretty amazing. They flower in the dry season, so before any leaves um, have come out. And um, their fruits can be enormous. So some of the Suarezensis fruits that I've seen are, are about this big. 
Section Longae tubae is comprised of uh, four different species. They are all similar in terms of having this elongated staminal column, which is where the name Longae tubae comes from. And they're united based on similar floral morphology and pollination systems, all being hawk moth pollinated. Um, so just a little bit of information about some of these species. So the species with the red petals there is Madagascariensis, although there are certain populations that have yellow um, petals. This will be important for later. Um, Ruber stipa is found is, is sort of a classic species of the spiny forest, although there are populations up in the remote northwest part of the island that have been very uh, understudied. Adansonia zaw, seen here, is found widespread across the island in the orange distribution on the map. And then species periary is the most endangered out of all. So there are less than 200 trees left in the wild. They are found in the subhumid forests of the north. They're also hawk moth pollinated, but what makes them especially interesting is they're pollinated by Xanthopan morganii, which is Darwin's hawk moth. So these are the, the huge hawk moths that Darwin predicted to occur based on the orchid with the extremely long nectar spur. Okay, so those are the key players to my story today. And I'm gonna very briefly walk through sort of three different vignettes about uh, different scales of Baobab's evolutionary history. So we'll first sort of look at macroevolutionary patterns, their genealogical history at the genus level, uh, patterns of floral evolution in the group, then we'll dive into assessing geographic patterns of gene flow with, uh, among species. And then finally, I'll end with intraspecific variations um, or population level variation in the African baobab. Okay, so I am going to skip all of the years of work that went into producing this phylogeny. Um, I will say, for those of you who care, it was a custom designed targeted sequence capture approach. Enough said. Um, and, and if anyone else is also interested, this was a Bayesian concordance analysis, so the numbers on the branches cannot be equated with bootstrap support values. All right, moving on. <laughs> so I have a few uh, main takeaways that, from this slide here. So the Australian lineage is more closely related to the African lineage which was quite surprising. We were sort of expecting that the African lineage was more closely related um, to the Malagasy lineage. Um, but those two uh, geographic lineages are more closely related to each other than to Madagascar. There was, as predicted, a single dispersal event to Madagascar and then a diversification. The two key takeaways that I want to focus on, though, is we're look we found that two samples of this species, ZA, this is the widespread species, uh, it has, it's not, so I took a sample from the north and I took a sample from the south, and they're not each other's closest relatives. So the sample in the north was more closely related to two other species than to the sample in the south. Could be error, we'll dive into this in the next section. But it's important takeaway. This is a, a species that does have a lot of variation in floral color and markings, as I'm showing you in the photographs on the right hand side here. Um, but nonetheless, this is all we know at this point. The next interesting takeaway was that the four species of Longae tubae were not each other's closest relatives. And so this again is the four species that have uh, yellow to orange, red colored flowers. They're all hawk moth pollinated. And what we actually find is that Ruber stipa was the earliest diverging. And then the remaining species of Longae tubae are more closely related or share a common ancestor more recently with the section Brevetuvae. This was quite surprising. And this relationship wasn't resolved previously using molecular data, but given morphology and given pollination syndromes, we would expect them to be each other's closest relatives. We have a few, we had a few hypotheses to explain why maybe we were getting this pattern. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna jump to the conclusion. What we found was that about 17% of the genome of Rubristipa integrated into the core Longae tubae clade. So what I mean by that is in the, the ancestor to the remaining three species of Longae tubae actually hybridized or, and then back crossed with the ancestor to Ruber stipa. And about 14% of its genome um, integrated into this, this, uh, the remaining uh, Longae tubae clade. 
That was using a phylogenetic network, network approach. We also took a more traditional SNP-based approach using Abababa tests, and we found similar results. So this is um, interesting because what this is suggesting is that perhaps this, these two independent transitions per, that appeared to be two independent transitions for flower coloration and hawk moth coloration could actually be explained by ancient intergression. <laughs> So with some collaborators at the University of Wisconsin, um, a group of great statisticians, Cecile Hane, we developed an approach to test this. So given a phylogenetic network, we were able to statistically test the probability that those traits, flower color and pollination system, were carried by the hybridization edges. And so I'm showing you here that same phylogenetic network as before, given an unrooted tree. And what it's showing is that the, if, you ancestor, if you infer what the ancestor state was for each individual or for each species, it gives you a probability of that character state. So what this is showing here is for flower color, although the results were very similar for pollination system, perhaps not unexpectedly, what it's showing here is that the, the ancestor of the Malagasy baobabs was most likely white uh, flowers and hawk moth pollinated. And then with this transition at some point to yellow flowered hawk moth pollinated ancestral ruber stipa, with that introgression event, there was a strong probability that it aided in the transition of flower color and hawk moth pollination in that lineage. Um, for those of you who care about the statistics behind this, we did also correct for the case of it possibly being convergent evolution, so the probability that there were two independent random transitions and so forth. Um, so that method did correct for that. Okay, so I'm going to take pause here for a second. Because if you really think about what this means, looking at these probabilities, what it suggests is that there would have been the ancestor of either this lineage or this lineage. It was, there was a greater probability that would have, it would have been a white flowered hawk moth pollinated lineage that would have had to have um, pollinated with a mammal pollinated white flowered individual based on these probabilities. Well, this seems kind of unlikely if you're just looking at it at the macroevolutionary level. But we already have evidence within Adansonia itself of fluid pollination systems. And so we have evidence that in the Malagasy brevetuvae that are primarily pollinated by lemurs and bats, there we've observed hawk moths actually visiting those flowers. We can't say if they're actually pollinating them yet because we haven't done the studies, but we know they're visiting them. Same goes for the, the boabs in Australia. They were thought to be primarily pollinated by hawk moths. There's now evidence that, at least in certain populations, bats are serving as primary pollinators. And they did do the studies that they're actually pollinating. They're visiting and pollinating. And then in South Africa, the African baobab, traditionally thought to be bat pollinated, we have evidence of hawk moths visiting um, those trees in certain populations. And I'm going to return to this in sort of part three. OK, so where we left, left off with this sort of genus level phylogeny is that we have evidence for integration among these longitude taxa, and we have some suggestions that there might be some cryptic species in Madagascar with the sampling of Aza not being each other's closest relatives. And so that begs the question, are there other populations with mixed ancestry? Are there species that are, that are hiding on the landscape that haven't been um, studied yet? So that'll take us to part two. So to get at some of those questions, we wanted to explore sort of geographic patterns of variation. And so to do this, you really have to sample broadly across each species range. So again, here I'm showing the species distribution in the map and then my sampling scheme um, on the left hand side here. And of course, the best part of working in Madagascar is it's always an adventure. <laughs> so uh, some fun pictures from the field. So upon returning from field work, I was contacted by a researcher at uh, CIRAD, Cyril Cornu, who published this bulletin um, asking if they, if they had found a new species of baobab. And so they sent me this uh, material and 
really the only information I got was that it was a population. They wouldn't even uh, provide any morphological data, but that's because um, I think, you know, they, they wanted to keep this population private for the time being, which is respected. But I know it came from somewhere within this region. And uh, it was, so it's at this range interface of Madagascariensis and Rubristipa. And if you, meant, if you remember what I mentioned earlier, Ruber stipa is the species that's really classic to the spiny forests in the south. And these populations up in the northwest really haven't been uh, thoroughly collected. So there's very few collections, herbarium collections, of Ruber stipa in these populations. We just know they're there. OK, so I took the same sort of phylogenetic approach as before. Here, I've expanded the sampling. I'm using allelic data now for those of you who are interested. And the main takeaway is that I'm color coding samples um, by clade uh, and by traditional species designations. And so really, all you need to know, again, is you see there's two clades of orange, which is the species za. So now, even with increased sampling, we have good evidence that the populations of za in the north are distinct from the populations of Zaw in the south. And they're actually more closely related to Madagascariensis and Perrieri than southern Zaw. So this is pretty fascinating. And it could be explained by, for those of you who know Madagascar, the San Bruno River Basin. So this basin um, is an interesting sort of climatic break. Um, it's been shown to act as a barrier for gene flow in other different lineages, whether it be the river itself or the climatic region. Um, but if you, if you look very carefully at where the sampling occurred, they're both, the San Bruno River is, the pretty, is a strong distinction between these populations. And I think this is great because this molecular data confirms observations about geogra geographic variation um, that was described almost 100 years ago now. So if you look across this species range, there's been a lot of taxonomic changes that has occurred based on differences in morphology. So populations in the north typically have leaflets that are sessile, and they're very elongated in the south, which I'm showing you in the pictures here. They also have differences in the, in the fruit peduncle. So in the north, they're sort of elongated and narrow. In the, in the south, they're, they're much shorter and fatter. And there's, uh, like I mentioned, a lot of difference in floral color and floral markings. If that is a cross, is that, if that has sort of a geographic pattern to it, the research hasn't been done yet, um, but it should be. But so because of this, we might argue that this, this data, along with the molecular data, suggests that we need to resurrect some old species names and it warrants taxonomic revision for ZA. What's interesting is when we look at the plastid tree, this actually suggests um, multiple gene flow events, not just related to ZA. So again, here I'm color coding clades by species, uh, d uh, traditional species distinctions here. And again, we're seeing the different populations of ZA. We also see a, some samples of ZA embedded within Ruber stipa, which would suggest gene flow between those, which I'm sort of depicting in this graphic on the right-hand side here. And what we're also seeing is a northern and southern populations of Madagascariensis also falling out in separate places in the plastid tree. So this is the maternal lineage. And if you look at where the northern and southern populations break in geographic space, there again, um, it's the San Bruno River that separates them. So uh, there's clearly been some multiple gene flow events in the, in the ancestor populations of these species. And if you recall that um, new species of baobab that was sent to me, um, I forgot to point out. So it fell within Ruber stipa in the nuclear tree. And in the plastid tree, it's falling with Madagascariensis, which I would actually suggest it's of some hybrid origin. So using sort of statistical phylogenetic network approaches, we were able to confirm that that sample is of mixed ancestry. So 80% of its genome is coming from Rubrostipa. The other 20% of its genome is coming from Madagascariensis.
So if you look closely at sort of the historical taxonomic records of Ruber stipa, again, there's been some interesting taxonomic changes over the many years. So again, molecular data is confirming what traditional taxonomists sort of already knew, right? And so what we see here is that, oh, my star is off point there. But so there is some differences between populations in, in the north and populations in the south that have been written about, particularly their ecologies are completely different. Um, there's also some differences in staminal tube length, some other differences with, with um, leaf form, but it hasn't really been studied. Um, so this is another example of um, perhaps a species that's uh, um, needing some taxonomic revisions, uh, but we also desperately need more collecting in these remote parts of Madagascar that haven't yet been done. And who knows what additional unsampled populations are. There's, there's always rumors of baobab populations in Madagascar that haven't been studied um, at this, the scientific level. And so that work needs to be done. But I would argue that our phylogenomic result, results, coupled with the tr traditional taxonomy, do warrant um, perhaps taxonomic revisions that would make these trees more worthy of conservation efforts. And part of the reason why is the three species that have evidence for mixed ancestry and gene flow, they are the most widespread on the island, but they're also the ones currently listed as of least concern by the IUCN. And so given the uh, incredible need for conservation efforts in Madagascar, I think this, this work serves as an important sort of case study as to why we need um, increased efforts there. Great. All right, so in my last um, 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about um, intraspecific variation in the African baobab. So as I mentioned earlier, some of my interests are exploring how population level variation can explain sort of these larger macroevolutionary patterns. And so I wanna just kind of use um, this, this next little vignette as a, as a way to illustrate that point. So the African baobab, as I mentioned, um, is a species that possesses floral traits classically associated with bat pollination. So these are very large flowers. They, um, they're, they hang on these large, um, uh, uh, they're pendulous flowers. They're white. They're uh, extremely fragrant. A lot of people consider them sort of musky fragrance. I found them to be delightful, but um, they have very large reproductive parts. Again, these are extremely large flowers. And again, they have nocturnal anthesis. So they open at night um, and they're receptive for 12 hours. So some work that I was doing on a related project to the African baobabs with colleagues in South Africa, um, we realized as we were there that we weren't actually seeing any bats pollinating these trees. And after talking with the local community, uh, we were trying to get a sense of, well, well, surely bats must be here. They're known to occur in, in the, this is the Limpopo province of South Africa. There's a number of different bat species that are found in that region, but no one has ever observed bats on baobabs of that region. And so we, we did some citizen science work to try to get a sense of what was visiting these baobabs. Um, and then I, uh, in, I um, was able to get a grant through USAID, actually, to look at the pollination biology. And the reason why is because this population of people in Limpopo actually collect baobabs for the global market. So they're using them to extract pulp and seed oil. Um, so there's great economic potential um, with baobabs, which was why USAID was interested in funding the research. So I... Um, set up myself in the tree canopy, and I did not see any bats. <laughs> so um, I was there for the flowering season, which is about a month, and we, we, I was able to observe um, a number of different hawk moss species and bush babies, but no bats. Well, you may be saying, well, your presence in the tree canopy surely deterred them. Well, I thought so as well until I checked all my camera traps. So I set up motion trigger detector camera traps, and again, not a single bat was captured on video. I was able to get more bush babies, and I was able to get uh, hawk moths, as you can see visiting here, um, but not a single bat. So the hawk moths visited at about a rate of like four visits per flower per hour. And if you watch them, they would come, they would feed on the flower, they would leave, 
And then, like I said, about 20 minutes later, you get a hawk moth to come back. Who's to say if it was the same one or a different one? Um, but nonetheless, they were active. But again, you can't equate a floral visitor to a pollinator, OK? So in order to test that, um, we set up some um, exclusion experiments. So I excluded, I built these cages that were to be excluding bats. And then I built cages that were to exclude hawk moths. And we did some observations to make sure this, um, this um, methodology was seemed appropriate. And what we found was that when we excluded hawk moths, the, those flowers did not set fruit. When we were allowed for hawk moths, those trees did indeed set fruit. And we compared it with um, an open control here. So here, if you just tag flowers on the tree, and then you come back and you count how many set fruit, you get about 9% that set fruit. When you exclude just the bats allowing for hawk moths, you get about 7%. When you exclude hawk moths, you get zero. The reason why this number is so low is because we did get our cages. Uh, there was some theft with our cages at, at one site, unfortunately. OK, so what's even more interesting now is when we looked at floral scent profiles, because some previous researchers looked at floral scent profiles of baobabs in Senegal. And these previous researchers classified um, finding a number of different sulfurous compounds. So sulfurous compounds are really um, common in bat pollinated species in the New World. They're not as common as bat pollinated species in the old world, but they are found in baobabs. Uh, these researchers and my, flor um, my floral uh, profiles also found sulfurous compounds. But what was really the most surprising was the presence of sweet smelling sesquiterpenes. So the researchers that collected profiles in West Africa did not find any of these compounds. These compounds accounted for something like 60 to 70% of the floral profiles in South Africa. And these, these compounds are often associated with hawk moth pollinated lineages. So it's possible that there's some type of geographic um, variation that's occurring in pollination systems that may serve as a precursor to divergence. So here's what we know about um, floral profiles, just summarized um, at a broad level. We know that these in populations are bat pollinated because that research has been done. We did not find any bats in South Africa. We found hawk moths with differing floral profiles. And this data is a bit outdated. Um, I have some new data now, but there's pretty clear genetic structuring uh, um, between populations in West Africa and populations in Southern Africa. So they're, they're, um, I'm, I'm working on dating the divergence between those different populations at more fine scale. But they are indeed, they have been diversifying from each other for, for a number of years now. And so I think that this serves as a great um, sort of case study where we can look at how intraspecific variation may explain larger macroevolutionary patterns. So in this example, we have differences in pollinator visitation rates. I don't have time to talk about it today, but there might be differences in floral traits. And there's clearly some genetic structure between different populations. And that might result in divergence in the future, but it definitely could explain patterns um, at the broad scale level within Adansonia itself. So there's been multiple transitions of pollination systems in this group's genealogical history. Um, it has, they're all still nocturnally pollinated. But it's not surprising that there might be secondary pollinators when a species is nocturnally pollinated. So there might actually be more shifts between hawk moth and bat pollination. Um, and they're not maybe perhaps discrete pollination systems. There, there, must be, there might be more fluidity than previously thought. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank all of the funders and all of the great communities and all of the places that I've worked, all of my co-authors and collaborators. And because I wanted to use this opportunity to talk about myself <laughs> a little bit, I just want to highlight a few future research interests for people that are interested. So moving forward, I'm interested in looking at paired um, plant pollinator and plant dispersal population genetic structure with, uh, using a case study of Adansonia within Madagascar in particular 
I'm also interested in evolutionary pathways of uh, pollination systems between, in particular, hawk moth and bat pollinated lineages. This has been studied, Nathan and I were just talking about this before the talk. So this has been studied in lineages in the New World. Um, but the, the, bat, the bats that are pollinating in Africa are from a completely different clade. And so there might be completely different dynamics that are occurring um, in Africa. So I'd love to look at these transitions in African lineages. And then I'm also particularly interested in characterizing pollination networks for ecosystem conservation and applying this approach, at least as a case study for some of our conservation sites in Madagascar, as well as some of the forest fragments that are remaining in Madagascar. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank you all. And I left time for questions because there's always bit of questions. Thank you. Thank you.